Bonjour à tous and welcome to the first guided French listening exercise, a series of videos in which we'll be listening to some authentic materials and then going through them and talking about them and seeing if we can improve our listening skills. In this video we're going to listen to an extract from Europe 1, which is a wonderful website for all things French news, and the extract is called L'argent de poche, quand commencer ce pocket money, when do we begin? Now, this kind of video is completely experimental, I've never done it before, so I would really appreciate your feedback. Of course, I don't want to make an entire series if this isn't going to help you, so um, please do let me know what you think in the comments. Now, you've probably noticed that this particular extract was published in November 2013, so it's a little bit old now, but I think it's a good example of some of the difficulties that we can come across when listening to authentic materials. So, to begin with, I just want you to listen to the extract. Okay, there'll be nothing really very interesting on the screen to look at. I just want you to listen, see what you can understand. Can you pick out any words? Can you pick out any expressions? Can you maybe even figure out exactly what it is they're talking about? So let's have a listen. Bon, alors d'abord Aurélien, on va commencer avec les plus petits. À ouais. quel âge euh, peut-on commencer à donner de l'argent de poche 6 ou 7 ans, c'est l'âge conseillé par les pédopsychiatres. Parce qu'avant l'enfant n'a pas conscience de la valeur de l'argent, autant ouais. les laisser jouer à la marchande et échanger une pomme en plastique contre un jeton. <rire> euh, alors après, combien on donne Pour la tranche 7-11 ans, ce sera 12 euros par mois en moyenne. Donc on commence doucement, hein, c'est l'âge où on économise patiemment oui. mois après Là, mois euh, quand on veut s'offrir un, un petit cadeau. Je ne sais pas vous, moi c'était pour les petites voitures, hein, <rire> clairement. Euh, ensuite, ça monte à 20 euros par mois pour les 12-13 ans, pour aller jusqu'à presque 50 euros vers 17 ans. En tout cas, c'est une première étape, commencer à gérer un petit budget, apprendre à se responsabiliser. Et puis ce que font aussi beaucoup de parents quand ils le peuvent, c'est ouvrir un livret pour mettre de côté un peu d'argent. Le livret A, ça peut se faire dès la naissance. Ensuite, il y a le livret jeune que l'on peut ouvrir à partir de 12 ans. Il est plafonné à 1600 euros. Impossible de retirer de l'argent dans le dos de papa, maman. Et puis donc, il y a, y a ce livret, ces placements. Et puis, il y a ensuite la solution du, du compte en banque. Hein, plus largement, ça... Pour le coup, c'est plus vieux. Donc. Voilà, légalement, c'est à partir de 16 ans ouais. qu'un adolescent peut être titulaire d'un compte courant. Ça se fera euh, forcément avec l'accord des parents jusqu'à 18 ans. Et euh, des comptes euh, qui sont accompagnés d'une carte de retrait avec autorisation euh, systématique, là encore, euh, des parents. Euh, parfois un chéquier, ça c'est vraiment euh, euh, aléatoire. Mmh. Euh, les parents doivent de toute façon se porter euh, caution auprès de la banque et ils peuvent définir une limite mensuelle de retrait. Et puis, histoire de ne pas donner trop, de, de trop, trop tôt de mauvaises habitudes, <rire> les découvertes ne sont pas ah oui. tolérés. Euh, il existe également des nouveautés qui peuvent correspondre aux besoins des adolescents, comme par exemple le compte Nickel. Ce sont ces comptes que vous pouvez ouvrir chez votre buraliste de la banque low cost. Pas de découvert autorisé, pas de crédit, pas de chèque, mais pas de frais bancaires non plus. Idéal pour un premier compte sans trop de contraintes ni de risques pour les parents. À la découverte donc de l'indépendance et de l'autonomie financière pour nos jeunes Okay, so if after one listen you heard that, you understood it really, really easily, maybe you want to move on and listen to something that's a, that's a little bit more challenging. If, though, you only understood 80%, 60%, 40%, 30%, 20%, 10%, then that's fine, that's what we're here for. Okay, I think it's better to listen to authentic materials from the very start rather than training yourself to understand very simple language and then being shocked by how quickly people speak in the real world. So even if you didn't understand anything, we're going to do our best to overcome these difficulties. Now, I'm no mind reader, so I don't know exactly what you found difficult with this, if anything, but these are some of the things that I think might have caused some problems. First of all, we have les noms, names, and les emprunts étrangers, foreign borrowings or loan words. Okay, the problem with these is that they're not words that we learn in our normal vocabulary, and so we don't learn to recognize them. So when a name comes up, how do we know? When a foreign word comes up, how do we know what it means? How do we know how to look it up? Then we have langage familier, so colloquial language. Okay, generally, when you're learning a language, you learn the standard. So when people use fairly familiar language, you're not necessarily going to understand it. That's limited to a certain extent on the radio because of course the presenters have to speak 
standard French, but there are some instances of relatively colloquial language in this extract, so we'll have a look at that later on. Then we have l'hésitation, which of course is hesitation. Naturally, people hesitate when they speak. So how can we differentiate between the hesitation sounds and actual words? Then we have vocabulaire technique et spécifique. So this extract was all about pocket money, banking and things like that. So there are lots of banking terms that maybe you're not familiar with. And then finally, we have le bégaiement, which I think is a wonderful word, which means stammering or stuttering. So, you know, when we speak, we trip over our words sometimes. And similarly with the hesitation, how do we know when someone's stammering, stuttering, and when they're just using an expression perhaps that we've never heard before? So we're going to listen to it again. This time, I'm going to give you subtitles in French. OK, I could give you English subtitles, but then that would defeat the object. I don't think you'd really learn anything because you'd stop really trying to listen and you just rely on the subtitles and some work has to go into this okay if I just give you the English then you'd probably stop listening subconsciously and it's not necessarily a, um, a choice okay but we need to put some work into it in order to get something out of it so the subtitles will only be in French that said I have provided some translations and these translations are either of the technical vocabulary that perhaps you've never heard before and also some words and expressions that I think are useful that you should pick up on whenever you listen to something you've got to see what you can pick out be it words or expressions grammar structures whatever okay and so I've highlighted some of the things that I think will be useful to you so let's have another lesson and then we'll have a look at how to overcome some of these difficulties Bon, alors d'abord Aurélien, on va commencer avec les plus petits. À ouais. quel âge euh, peut-on commencer à donner de l'argent de poche 6 ou 7 ans, c'est l'âge conseillé par les pédopsychiatres. Parce qu'avant l'enfant n'a pas conscience de la valeur de l'argent, autant ouais. les laisser jouer à la marchande et échanger une pomme en plastique contre un jeton. <rire> euh, alors après, combien on donne Pour la tranche 7-11 ans, ce sera 12 euros par mois en moyenne. Donc on commence doucement, hein, c'est l'âge où on économise patiemment oui. mois après Là, mois euh, quand on veut s'offrir un, un petit cadeau. Je ne sais pas vous, moi c'était pour les petites voitures, hein, <rire> clairement. Euh, ensuite, ça monte à 20 euros par mois pour les 12-13 ans, pour aller jusqu'à presque 50 euros vers 17 ans. En tout cas, c'est une première étape, commencer à gérer un petit budget, apprendre à se responsabiliser. Et puis ce que font aussi beaucoup de parents quand ils le peuvent, c'est ouvrir un livret pour mettre de côté un peu d'argent. Le livret A, ça peut se faire dès la naissance. Ensuite, il y a le livret jeune que l'on peut ouvrir à partir de 12 ans. Il est plafonné à 1600 euros, impossible de retirer de l'argent dans le dos de papa maman. Et puis donc il y a, y a ce livret, ces placements, et puis il y a ensuite la solution du, du compte en banque, hein, plus largement ça pour le coup, c'est plus vieux. Donc. Voilà, légalement, c'est à partir de 16 ans ouais. qu'un adolescent peut être titulaire d'un compte courant. Ça se fera euh, forcément avec l'accord des parents jusqu'à 18 ans. Et euh, des comptes euh, qui sont accompagnés d'une carte de retrait avec autorisation euh, systématique, là encore, euh, des parents. Euh, parfois un chéquier, ça c'est vraiment euh, euh, aléatoire. Ouais. Euh, les parents doivent de toute façon se porter euh, caution auprès de la banque et ils peuvent définir une limite mensuelle de retrait. Et puis, histoire de ne pas donner trop, de, de trop, trop tôt de mauvaises habitudes, <rire> les découvertes ne sont pas ah oui. tolérés. Euh, il existe également des nouveautés qui peuvent correspondre aux besoins des adolescents, comme par exemple le compte Nickel. Ce sont ces comptes que vous pouvez ouvrir chez votre buraliste de la banque low cost. Pas de découvert autorisé, pas de crédit, pas de chèque, mais pas de frais bancaires non plus. Idéal pour un premier compte sans trop de contraintes ni de risques pour les parents. À la découverte donc de l'indépendance et de l'autonomie financière pour nos jeunes Okay, so hopefully the subtitles and the few translations helped you a little bit there. But of course, in doing that, I'm not improving your listening skills. I'm just kind of giving you the answers. So how do we overcome some of those difficulties that we spoke about before? Well, straight off the bat, I'm going to tell you that there is no magic formula. This takes work. And even with the advice I'm going to give you now, that doesn't mean that you're suddenly going to be an expert and everything is going to make sense. You need to do a lot of listening. But let's see what we can do to help ourselves a little bit. So first of all, we spoke about names and foreign words. So the name in this was Aurélien, which was only used once, but still. And Locust, which uh, I put entre guillemets because um, it's kind of one of those words that's perhaps not in a dictionary, but is used quite a lot. 
So, as I said before, the problem with these is that we don't learn them, and so we don't know how to recognise them. Now, of course, in real life, when you're speaking to someone, uh, you generally know the names of the people that you're speaking to, and if not, hopefully you'll be um, introduced to them, so that shouldn't be so much of a problem. In the case of radio, though, of course, we don't have any kind of indication of who's speaking. So, my suggestion if, is, if you're listening to the radio, try to listen to the same programme regularly, so that you get used to hearing who's presenting. The benefit with that as well is that if the name keeps coming up, it will be said in a different way every time. You know, if you're listening to this extract that we've just listened to, for example, and you think, oh, I'm just going to listen to that so I can understand it a little bit better, you're listening to the same thing. It's exactly the same uh, pronunciation. You know, you're just trying to listen to the same thing and maybe slow it down. I don't know. At the end of the day, it's the same every time. Whereas if you listen to a radio program that's on say every day, then the names will be said in different ways, maybe a different person will say it, and hopefully eventually you'll hear it well enough to be able to pick out all the sounds and then maybe look it up, um, not necessarily in a dictionary in the case of a name, but maybe online, uh, you know, a quick Google search, you might be able to find some names. Also, if you're listening to podcasts or, or radio online, quite often they'll give you the names of the presenters anyway, so you can look at those and be prepared to hear those names and think, OK, I'll listen out for that name just in case. Now, of course, loan words are a little bit more um, unpredictable. OK, we don't know which words they're going to use. And this one is just a case of really training your ear. OK, locust, it's not a very French sounding word. Of course, they say it with a French accent, but the sounds in that aren't very common in French to end a word with ST is not so common. So if you can hear it and think at least that sounds a little bit weird, then you're on the right track to figuring out what it is. In this case, like I said before, we're talking about banks. So low cost is quite a common expression when we're talking about banking and business and things like that. So if you can read up on the subject as well, you can find all of the um, common loan words. For example, as well, um, a lot of words to do with sort of modern food. So we have things like street food, uh, food truck, lots of words like this that have come in through the US um, and the UK and uh, generally English speaking countries. And if you read a lot about those, then you'll know to expect them in the spoken language as well. So it's all about sort of looking around the subject and seeing uh, which words come up quite a lot. So then we had the langage familier, the colloquial language. And as I said before, this is relatively limited um, in the radio broadcast. But of course, when you're speaking with friends and things, people are going to use colloquial language all the time. And again, this is a case of preparing yourself. Know or at least have an idea of what to expect. So, for example, in this extract, we had the use of ya instead of il y a. Very few people actually say il y a. Okay, next time you listen, either to this extract or someone else speaking, listen out for ya instead of il y a, because it's very rarely pronounced fully. Likewise with je ne sais pas, you know, we learn this expression. And in a lot of sort of deliberately made resources, people will say je ne sais pas. The problem is nobody says that. And if you learn to hear that, you'll be disappointed when you're listening to people speak because they very rarely say it. Okay, at most they'll say je ne sais pas, the kind of short menu. Uh, if not, they'll say je sais pas. Or sometimes in the really colloquial wor world, it'll just be je sais pas. So you've got to learn what people do. Okay, so this is a case of, again, doing lots of listening, maybe even Google search. Okay, colloquial French. Okay, maybe find a book. Okay, and learn what people do so you can learn to expect it. Okay, and also if you're going to listen to um, maybe deliberately made materials, find things where people maybe speak slowly but still speak like they normally do. So, for example, instead of saying je ne sais pas quoi faire, they say je sais pas quoi faire. So they're speaking slowly but they're still speaking in the same way that they normally do in terms of the way uh, they enunciate, or in the case of French, the way they don't enunciate. Okay, and that'll train you a little bit better. So you don't have to listen to super high-speed French all the time, provided that what you're listening to is still said in quite a native way. Okay, then we had um, hesitation, hésitation. And 
once more, it's about knowing what to expect. Okay, so we have these sounds. We have uh, un, ben, alors. Okay, these are sort of the generic French hesitation words. And if you know that these are the sounds that French people use, it should help when perhaps you've heard a word that you're not quite sure about. Okay, so let's say you've heard the word, um, I don't know, île, okay, which means island. Okay, if you know that the French don't hesitate with the sound e, which they don't generally, you don't hear someone go e. Okay, that's not really a thing. So if you hear this e sound, you can be fairly sure that this il that you've heard and not quite understood is a word and not hesitation. Okay. Likewise, you can go the other way around. If you hear a sort of er uh sound, which does appear in words as well, you can at least know that there's a possibility that it's hesitation. So if you hear something and you think, well, that sounds like a quite a familiar word, but it's got this funny sound at the start of it that I don't really understand, it could be hesitation. So again, in brief, it's about knowing what to expect and being able to eliminate certain possibilities. Then we have the stammering and stuttering. Okay, so this happened once in the extract that we listened to. We had histoire de ne pas donner de trop, 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 trop to de mauvaise habitude. Okay, now this one again, it's very unpredictable. Even the speaker doesn't know when he or she is going to, to uh, trip over his or her words. Okay, so for me, this one is about listening for the clues. Of course, he said trop many times. Okay, the reason he stumbled here is because we've got trop, to, de. Trop and to followed by each other um, is, is quite difficult to pronounce, even for a French person. Okay. And so he said trop an awful lot. Of course, though, it could just be an expression, but there's the indication of a slight chuckle. Okay, he kind of laughs at himself, and I think uh, she does as well. Okay, now, of course, he could just be telling a joke. Okay, but if you have that indication, there's something's funny about this. Okay, it means that you'll go back and you'll listen to it again and try and figure out what's funny. Okay, so it's kind of an indication that there's something of interest here, and in this case, it's um, hesitation or uh, tripping over your words more than anything rather than hesitation. And finally, I've put Google. Google is your friend. It is okay to use Google. A lot of people tell me, oh, I didn't want to look this word up because I felt like it was cheating. Fair enough, if you're doing an exam, you don't want to cheat. But if you're just learning French to learn French, or even if you are doing an exam and you're just doing some studying, it's okay to use Google. Okay, if you hear a word, okay, and you think, yeah, okay, I know what sounds are there, but I don't know what the word is. Try a few different possibilities. You know, there are a few different letter combinations that make different sounds. So try them out. Google them. See if you get any results. Try word reference. Word reference is very good because it will give you uh, suggestions if you've spelt something wrong. And you just have a look and, and see what you can find. Okay, be curious with these things. Don't just think, oh, I heard this word. I've never heard of the word before. Therefore, I can never know. Okay, Google things as much as you like. Okay. Word reference, as I said, is a wonderful place. I'll be doing a video on that soon, so look out for that. Okay, but don't be afraid to look things up, even if you think they might be wrong. Okay, try different things out. Okay, and sometimes you will you will get there. Okay, I promise. Okay, so what I wanted to do for this particular extract was um, give you a brief overview of what I think you should try to understand from this, starting with the most important information and then going to the least important. So first of all, you kind of want to know what are they talking about in general. So in this extract, we've got a title which helps, you know, we know it's about pocket money, We're talking about when to start giving children pocket money. Okay, and then we have a particular age, okay, that is advised by um, child psychiatrists, what is that age? How much is advised for, seven, advised for seven to 11 year olds? So they've not just given an age for when to start, but also um, quantities that should be given to children of certain ages. How much does it go up to later on in life? So again, you know, knowing these quantities, numbers are always very important. What do many parents do? Okay, so this is quite a, an open question. But it basically refers to the, the bank accounts and things, you know, a lot. Um, what do parents choose to do with the money that they're giving their children? What types of bank account are there? So once we've started uh, talking about the bank accounts, we've kind of moved away from um, pocket money itself. They then start talking about the different bank accounts that children can have. What restrictions do they impose? Of course, we can't just give 
miners complete access to banking they, they would all go wrong I imagine so there are certain restrictions uh, to give the parents some control and what are the advantages of bank accounts for young people so the overall um, message in this is you know the the benefits of having a bank account uh, for your child as opposed to just getting them to put it all in a I don't know in a piggy bank or something okay so I'd say all of this information kind of goes up I mean it's chronological as much as anything but you know if you understand the general idea okay then start going into the um, more detailed um, parts of what's what they're saying okay so if you can answer any of these questions you're on the right track okay even if you can't understand them all that's okay okay you just need to listen to it a few times and see what you can pick out and if you can pick out anything at all anything then you're going in the right direction you just need to persevere and keep listening so I have a few pieces of advice here some astuce some tips okay so first of all n'essayez pas de comprendre chaque mot don't try to understand every single word a lot of people will watch things they'll listen to things and they'll say oh I didn't understand this word here and I didn't understand exactly what was said here you don't need to okay if you understand all those pieces of information that I just went through or the basic idea you don't need to know what every word means trust me it will get easier and eventually you will just understand all the words that are being said and you won't even think about it qu'est-ce que j'ai appris this is a question you need to ask yourself every time what have I learned I think I said this earlier on is when you've listened to something don't just think okay I understood that Okay, see if there were any expressions in there, or words, or grammatical structures that you can use yourself. Listening is a wonderful way of improving your speaking. Okay, it sounds a little bit odd, but if you can listen to someone else, listen to a native speaker and see how they say things, you can make your own French sound more natural. So ask yourself each time, what have I learned? Even if it's just one word, okay, try to use that word. Okay? Utilisez les phrases et les structures que vous avez écoutées, so that's similar to what I've just said. You know, what have you learnt? Okay, okay, I've learned three words today. Try and use those words, okay, because eventually they will assimilate themselves into your vocabulary, and there you go, you'll have learned three new words. Étudiez ce qui vous intéresse. Study what interests you. Okay, this one for me is incredibly important. If you're going to listen to things that you find boring, you're not going to learn as much as if you listen to things that you find interesting, because of course if it's interesting, you're not necessarily doing it for the language, you're doing it for the interest. Okay, so pick topics that you like. Okay, listen to things that interest you. Listen to news broadcasts about things that you are interested in, and that way you'll be more engaged, it'll feel less like a chore, and hopefully you'll learn a little bit more. And then you can learn how to speak about the things that interest you. And finally, lisez, lisez, Lisez. Again, reading is a wonderful way of improving your speaking and your listening because if you know more words, you understand more words and you can use more words. So reading is a wonderful way of increasing your vocabulary, both passive, i.e. the vocabulary that you understand from other people, and active, that being the words that you use yourself. So lots of reading is always very good. And that links in with studying the things that interest you. Okay, so read things that you find interesting. Okay, so my last piece of advice is to re-écouter, re-listen to that extract as many times as you like. I'll put a link to the actual uh, website in the description to this video. Unfortunately, there isn't a transcript, uh, but you've got the subtitles on this video if you need some extra help. Okay, and please, like I said before, do let me know what you thought of this video, if it's been helpful to you. I want to know if it's not been helpful to you I also want to know tell me how I can improve this tell me how I can help you to improve your own French and of course until next time à bientôt